welcome to the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies at Yale University. I especially want to welcome our friends and colleagues at the University of Connecticut who are joining us uh, for this special lecture via the live, live stream. And this is our first effort to better share some of our activities here at Yale FES with our friends at, at UConn. And I'm grateful to Provost Choi and his team uh, for making this possible. And I hope that there'll be many more exchanges in both directions of this kind uh, in the future. Uh, today's uh, special lecture, uh, in a very real sense, is the capstone to a series of activities that have extended really through my time as dean. I arrived here in the school just a few months before Copenhagen, and uh, I'm now leaving the school just a few months uh, after Paris. And what a difference those seven years have made. And it was our guest today who's made such an impact during that time. Uh, in Paris, there were more than 150 of our students uh, and alums and our faculty in a whole range of roles. And for those of us who were there, uh, I think it was an experience that we'll remember for a very long time. And of course, for everyone who was not there, uh, it was also a pivotal moment in the effort to fight uh, climate change at a global uh, level. On Friday, uh, too, we had the ceremony, uh, the signing ceremony for the Paris Agreement uh, that took place uh, in New York. And uh, for those of you who haven't read uh, Secretary Kerry's remarks, um, it's well worth uh, doing so. Uh, he emphasized not only the uh, urgency and importance of, of climate change, but also the fact that uh, even though we know that this agreement does not go as far as we would like, that it's the most important and most significant uh, agreement in our global attempts uh, to attack uh, this problem and is significant for the message it sends to the markets and the private uh, sector. And uh, I had the opportunity recently to talk to a group of people who are investing a large amount of money. And uh, when the topic of coal came up, uh, they were very clear that it, uh, they wouldn't be investing uh, in coal and that it was actually very difficult these days to find a, a decent uh, investment in coal. Another thing that was interesting from uh, uh, Secretary Kerry's uh, remarks was not only what he said, but also what he did, which was he carried his granddaughter to the front of the room and signed the uh, agreement with his granddaughter sitting on his lap, which I think was a kind of a great way to highlight the importance of this uh, uh, for the future. Uh, in a moment, I'll introduce our distinguished speaker, but just so that you all know how this is going to work, uh, after the speech, I'll invite to the stage uh, Dan Esty, who's Hill House professor here in the school, as well as at the Yale Law School. Uh, Dan, most of you know, but for those on the live stream, uh, he's director of the Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policy here, serves on the advisory board of the Yale Center for Business and Environment, which he also founded in 2006, and uh, has recently returned to Yale, relatively recently, having served as Commissioner of uh, uh, Energy and Environmental Protection for the state of Connecticut. And then there'll be a conversation between Dan and our guest, and there'll be an opportunity for questions, and I hope to our friends and colleagues at UConn, there'll be some questions uh, coming from UConn, which will be transmitted via uh, uh, Matt Garrett here in the room. So now on to uh, the reason that we're gathered uh, here today. It's my great pleasure to welcome our speaker, Cristiana Figueres, the top UN authority on global climate change. She's been executive secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change since July 2010, and she took her position uh, in the aftermath of, of Copenhagen. She's been responsible for the climate negotiations uh, ever, since, ever since and was pivotal uh, in leading the process to a universally agreed regulatory uh, framework through a whole series of conferences uh, of the parties that brought together uh, national and subnational governments, corporations, activists, institutions, communities of faith, brought them all together uh, in a very special way that culminated, uh, as you all know, uh, in Paris. Um, Ms. Figueres has a long trajectory in the field of global climate change, having been a member of the Costa Rican negotiating team uh, uh, in the, from 1995 to 2009, and having played a key role uh, in many of the efforts, uh, both uh, on the front of the stage and also uh, behind the scenes. She's a dedicated public servant who spent a huge proportion of her life uh, working on, on broad issues that affect people's everyday lives, including the climate change. And please join me uh, in welcoming her here to Yale.
Hi, how are you? Um, good to be here with you. And Dean, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. In particular, thank you very much for using my name um, as it is, because yesterday uh, my colleague Halder and I were at uh, a major economies forum meeting. Uh, and of course, it is always attended by China, as you can imagine. And so we have Chinese translation. And uh, the minister of, an, of uh, China took the floor and was making an intervention. And then I was listening, and I heard, you know, and Mr. Figless something, something. And, Mr. and I thought, oh, who's Mr. Figless? I shouldn't follow. It was me. So I thought, OK, well, that's a, that's a new name. So I'm, I'm very glad to be back to Figueres this morning, and I'm back to my feminine side, Miss Figueres, as opposed to Mr. Figless. Um, anyway, so delighted to be here um, again. I was trying to remember that. When was the last time I was here? I don't know. So we just, really? I've been a little bit busy in the past six years, maybe. OK. Anyway, it's del uh, delightful to be back on, uh, on campus. And thank you very much, Dan, for, for the very uh, kind, um, kind invitation. Um, so I wanted to, uh, to start uh, with, uh, with the moment that the dean, thanks, with the moment that dean was, um, the dean was talking about the Paris Agreement. And I heard uh, this morning from from so many students who were in Paris that now I know why nobody else fit into the venues because Yale had taken over all the badges that were available for anyone. Um, so, but, uh, but quite, an, uh, quite an impressive event, right? Uh, and let me just start by saying to put it into the context uh, of history. Uh, it is the first time in the history of mankind that we have had a unanimous decision by all governments, 195 of them at that moment, today in 196 parties, but at that moment 195 unanimously agreed. And if you've tried to do anything unanimously, you know, in your families or in your classrooms or whatever, you know how difficult it is to get unanimity. But this was a unanimous decision. Not only what is, was it a unanimous decision, it was a unanimous decision to do something that is actually pretty impressive. It is the intentional, intentional change, of course, of the global economy. The last time that we really transformed the global economy to such a degree, it was uh, through the Industrial Revolution, and that was not an intentional uh, change. That was actually a market-driven and resource-driven, because we discovered oil, we then developed the internal combustion engine, and history took off from there. Uh, and so that transformation of the global economy was, um, was not an intentional policy decision. This is the first time that we have taken an intentional decision to change the course of the global economy. Not bad. Uh, and be because it was uh, a decision of such portent, then uh, you can imagine that that was one of the uh, reasons why we had not just 150 uh, Yale students, but we also, much less importantly, we had 150 heads of state who also came and uh, beat there the UN uh, record, in fact, also beat uh, historical record because we have never had, for any topic at any occasion, we've never had 150 heads of state or government under one roof, on one day, on one, uh, on one topic. And I will remind you, two weeks after the Paris attacks, right? So you can imagine the security nightmare that that was, very, very, uh, very, uh, uh, quite a, a, a headache for French uh, security to have 150 heads of state under one roof uh, on one day. Uh, and then on Friday, as though that were not enough, we again beat world record. The current or the previous record that was held for the uh, signatures that came in from governments on the opening day of a legally binding treaty was held uh, by the law of the sea that on opening day brought in 119 signatures um, and one instrument of ratification. And on Friday, we beat that record. Uh, and we had 175 signatures and 15 instruments of ratification, with 19 more countries stating that they would ratify in this 
in this year. So uh, really, by all accounts, no matter whether you speak about it from a policy point of view, the decision of countries, or whether you speak about it from a numerical statistical point of view, by all accounts, record-breaking um, event, the Paris Agreement. So the question is, well, why? Why was that such a big deal? And why does it continue to be such a big deal? I would argue there are many reasons, but I would like to uh, focus on two today. The reason why I think that we actually had to take the Paris Agreement to that level of engagement is because, first, there is now a, at least a fundamental, although not a mainstreamed, but a fundamental understanding that unabated climate change is the most powerful threat to stability. So I will talk about first the threat to stability. I will talk about how climate change is the greatest destabilizer that we have ever um, faced. The second uh, very big idea here, the second reason why this needs to have uh, the, the kind of engagement that we have is because answering climate change, addressing climate change, the policies and measures that we put in place in order to address climate change are also the greatest restabilizer that we have ever known. But that piece is not as well understood as the first. We have not been able to analyze, quantify, communicate the piece of the restabilization as well as we have of the destabilization. So let me start with the destabilization. Why is climate such a threat to our stability? Let me start with geological stability. Um, we, the last geological period that uh, we very clearly saw started was the Holocene era. This started about 11,000 years ago. Somewhere in the middle of that, just 6,000 years ago, we, Homo sapiens, began to uh, take over in, uh, in the kind of humanization that we know. Well, we sort of moved along with the Earth uh, for about 6,000 years until we hit the Industrial Revolution, the discovery of oil, the use of coal. Uh, and since then, which is only 150 years ago, which in the history of the planet is a blink, or half a blink. 150 years ago, we started what many geologists are now understanding to be the Anthropocene era, a new era that we are just beginning to form. The Anthropocene era is unlike any geological era that has ever existed in the history of this planet because it is determined by man and a little bit by women, <laughs> mostly by men, uh, or mostly by humans, let's say. Uh, and it is an era uh, that uh, is going to be characterized by the fact that it is humans who have now become a geological force. It is humans who are now exercising their inordinary power of changing the nature of nature itself. And it is humans who are now determining the evolution of nature and the evolution of the planet, unseen in the history of the planet. Uh, one, of our, uh, one of our authors, Elizabeth Corbet, calls it the sixth extinction. And I think you just with that term, you can begin to understand what we in, our, uh, in the wisdom of our power are doing in the Anthropocene. So geological stability being disrupted. Second, uh, stability, environmental stability. All of these destabilizers are linked, but it's helpful to understand them conceptually different from each other. Environmental stability. The air that you're breathing right now is air that has never existed in this planet, on this planet. Uh, this air that we're breathing right now has 400 parts per million of uh, CO2, that concentration has never existed. 
and uh, in recorded history, and we, we humans have actually uh, done this. We have never had uh, the record of historical top, top temperatures, average temperatures that we have right now. 14 of the 15 latest years have been, each one of them, the top uh, hottest year on record, and it continues. Um, and the long list of extreme weather events, I'm sure, is known to all of you. So there is no doubt, no doubt, that climate uh, is really a huge destabilizer here in our natural environment. The third piece that I wanted to put before you with respect to um, threat to stability is the macroeconomic and financial stability. We are now at the point that we are seriously threatening our financial stability, and nobody has been as clear about that threat as Mark Carney has, uh, a Canadian who leads, uh, is the governor of the Bank of England, who has very, very clearly put out to the Financial Stability Board, those uh, who are in charge of ensuring that we don't go into instability financially. Uh, he has very clearly put out majorly two uh, factors that are destabilizing the global economy and the, uh, and the financial system. The first is that the value of the physical assets that we have, everything that we have built, everything that we, we men, women, um, have built, the value of those physical assets is now being impacted and decreased by the impacts of climate change, by natural weather events. And so we are in the process of devaluing our assets, for which, by the way, we're not insured. Uh, and the second piece is uh, the fact that over time, because we are learning that we are in this uh, serious situation of threat, we have begun to move our financial assets, not the physical yet, the financial assets are beginning to migrate over to the less risky financial assets, but that transition of high carbon investments in high carbon assets, the investments themselves, okay, um, those investments themselves, which are the assets, are beginning to migrate over to low carbon, but that transition period is a very, very risky transition period, and it is leaving already quite a few of our assets stranded. And if you are uh, aware of the stranded literature, stranded asset literature, you will understand that those are the assets in which we're invested that are already losing their value, either because of the advance of policy or because of the abrupt hit against physics. Uh, and uh, we will have more and more of those. Currently, the tally that we have is $400 billion of CapEx, of capital expenditure that has been taken off the table in, um, in oil and gas explorations, in part because of the understanding that we're going toward a decarbonized world, in part because of the drop in oil price uh, and the fact that all of those investments were made when we thought that we were going to have $80, $90 per, uh, uh, per ton of oil, and hence those explorations are no longer financeable. But it does exemplify the kind of stranded asset threat that we're going to have with climate change. So a huge, huge threat to financial stability if that migration of the financial assets is not done in a planned and smooth fashion. We will be at a point of abrupt uh, jumps, as he calls, Mark Carney calls, the jump to distress, which the global economy will not be able to withstand. The fourth threat to stability is perhaps the one uh, that should be of most concern to us, which is the threat to human stability. And uh, not only are we uh, destabilizing our uh, society, but we're actually disrupting the trend of increasing development and welfare and well-being that we have been establishing over the past 20 to 25 years. So you will be aware of the uh, data of how we are eradicating poverty, how we're feeding more people, how we're actually getting to better levels of development around the world. 
All of that is under threat because of climate change and hence a huge disruption, if not a destruction of uh, the global development of the, the global development levels that we have had and that we aspire to in the future. Um, two issues there that are perhaps the, the most, uh, well, well, three, the physical impacts, everything having to do with storms, cyclones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you know those examples. Certainly rising sea levels. Uh, we have 62 million people who live in low-lying islands. Kiribati has already purchased land on Fiji because they know that they will have to migrate the entire population of Kiribati, so they have already purchased land on Fiji, just as an example of rising seas, but 62 million people that are exposed to rising sea level um, and the, the potential to lose their homes. Uh, but the one that I really wanted to emphasize today is land degradation, because we do not speak about it enough because it is a slow, silent crisis that is perhaps the most devastating to mankind. And we do not speak about it enough. 60% of all the non-ice land have, that we have, all the land that is not covered by ice, 60% of it is already degraded. 60% of our land is already degraded. And you can imagine what that means because that detonates a whole cycle of destruction that has to do with loss of water, loss of food capacity, that results then in human displacement of people who actually would have depended on that land for water and food. That means that links in then to migrants and refugees and then the link to um, to radicalization and conflict is not very far away. And let me give you a very concrete example. 2008, we had 20 countries in Africa that had um, food triggered riots because they didn't have enough food. 2008, 20 countries in Africa. Where were those countries in Africa? A, a, right around the center belt. So if you look at Africa and from north to, from east to west, and you take a center swath there between north and south, all the way from the east coast to the west coast, that's where those 20 countries were. Unsurprisingly, that's 2008, unsurprisingly, that is exactly the same belt where we had compounded and very accelerated desertification 10 years before that, and that is exactly the same swath of Africa where in 2012 we had the concentration of terrorist attacks in Africa. Do we have a link? Perhaps. I'm not going to say that climate change causes terrorism because that would be irresponsible, but I do bring your attention to the fact that there is a link between drought, lack of, uh, lack of uh, uh, drought, degradation, deforestation, forced migration, conflict, and in some cases, extreme violence. And just to get the order of magnitude of what we're talking about, in 2005, I live in Europe, Halder lives in Europe, we, uh, we live and work in, uh, in Germany. In 2015, uh, you will all have seen in the news the trauma and the drama that has been caused by one million refugees who have come to Europe and where the Europeans have simply not been able to respond to one million refugees. Well, since 2008, that's one million, okay. Since 2008, 20 million people have been displaced because of natural events, some of them not crossing borders, but 20 million. And just to look at it into the future, today we already have one billion people who do not have enough water, they do not have enough food. That is going to increase by at least 30% by 2030. That actually could cause the displacement of 300 million people. So if you can imagine the crisis that we have in Europe at 1 million, what are we going to do with 300 million displaced people? So the threats to the stability of this planet, to human life, to order, to society, to financial stability, to everything, to our macroeconomic system, are compounded. They are stacked, they are interlinked, and they are potentially devastating to humans. No doubt about that. That's the shadow side. Let's look at the light side. Because actually, 
the good news about this is that the opportunities of addressing climate change in a timely way also have stacked opportunities. And we stand right now in the middle of a crossroads of having to choose whether we're going to go with this doom and gloom scenario that I have painted for you, or whether we're actually going to get our act together to paint a very, very different future, which is possible. So how would that look like? Well, first of all, we know that there is an economic imperative to acting on climate change because transforming the global economy to the extent in which it needs to be transformed, a total decarbonization over the next 35 years, maximum, if not before, is going to bring energy independence to most countries, if not to all. Can you imagine what a difference it's going to make to islands who are currently paying 30 cents per kilowatt hour for electricity to all of a sudden have electricity at three cents per kilowatt hour or two cents a kilowatt hour. So it makes a huge difference to the people, to the national economy. So energy independence, because we can localize energy as opposed to bringing it always from wherever the fossil fuels are, we can have local energy, huge, huge economic, uh, economic benefits. In developing countries, it opens up, it throws the doors open for energy access because you no longer depend on centralized energy generation that then has to be transported with these completely outmoded electric cables that we have everywhere. Uh, all of that is going to go the, the way of history, just like landlines have gone the way of history. We're going to be having decentralized energy, clean decentralized energy that allows the 1.3 billion people on Earth right now who have no electricity to have electricity right there from the top of, uh, of their little home. That makes those people actually so much more productive and helps to raise them out of, uh, uh, out of poverty. And, you know, to say nothing of the number of jobs that are going to be created with a completely new economy, with completely new industries, and the kinds of professional opportunities that are going to be open to, uh, to, to young people because we are inventing and recreating most everything in society. This transformation is going to be deeper than the transformation that you have all witnessed, if you're at least 40 years old, that you have witnessed in the uh, information and communication technology. This is going to be an even deeper transformation. So actually, from the energy perspective and from an economic perspective, a very, very exciting future that we have in front of us. Currently, we're already investing $300 million a year into renewables. That's okay, but we have to get up to one trillion. Then we're going to begin to to make a, make a difference. And actually, because uh, the dean mentioned Kerry, he is very prone to saying that this uh, this new um, economy is actually a six trillion dollar market uh, with more opportunities for everybody than anything we've ever known. And he is uh, fundamentally correct. The second imperative uh, that I wanted to uh, pose to you uh, and deriving from the land use uh, doom and gloom scenario that I posed is uh, we can certainly do much better in our land use management. Absolutely. We do not have to follow that path. We can uh, understand that actually carbon is our enemy if it is in the air. But carbon is our friend if it is in the soil. Carbon that is solidified in the soil is actually our friend. It is our best friend. We can understand that soils, the soils that we have around the earth, are actually a safety deposit box for carbon. We have depleted that safety deposit box, but we can restore it. We can repopulate it with carbon. And in so doing, we would be rehabilitating the degraded lands that we have mismanaged for so many years. Those who are in, uh, in the main business of doing this say that we actually could be rehabilitating 12 million hectares per year for a very small cost. That would not just increase the absorption of carbon, uh, and I will talk about the ecological balance that we have to reach, but it would, it would increase food productivity, it would increase aquifer stability, it would certainly um, increase um, productivity, because when you think about that those people who are under the level of extreme poverty, $1 a day, 
they are spending 50 to 80% of their time and their income just getting food and water. That is a total, total mismanagement of human capacity. They should be able to have that there at a much, much level, a much lower level of cost so that they can become much more productive and much uh, productive members of society and, um, and be able to enjoy the basic welfare that is only a human right uh, for everyone. And the astonishing fact is that rehabilitating that, exter uh, that land actually costs more or less one third of what it is currently costing us to provide food and water for the refugees or for the displaced people that we have who currently do not have food and water. So for a third of the cost, we could do things so much better. So we can restabilize either through our investments in energy to make energy localized and to make uh, the, um, the cost uh, so much less. We can actually restabilize through land management making our land not only much more productive, but much more supportive of mankind and all of those people who depend on the land. So the case is very, very clear. We do have a choice, but just like the Paris Agreement was an intentional decision, the choice for mankind now has to be intentional. Because a business as usual, what we have been doing up until now is not going to get us there. We have to make an intentional choice of changing the course of the economy, changing our uh, policy and our, um, and our practices. And that is not the only challenge. The challenge is actually to make that intentional course choice over the next five years. Because to come back to realism here and off of the, you know, uh, whatever, la-la land of a perfection, we have five years. We have five years to be able to make the difference and change from a high carbon society to one that is headed straight into low carbon, high resilient. Because if we do not make that change in the five years, the lock-in of emissions, the lock-in of technology, the lock-in of finance is such that we're going to be loading the atmosphere to the point where we will no longer be able to eradicate poverty, because poor nations will always be reconstructing, reconstructing, reconstructing from the physical impacts, let alone the uh, data that I've just given you on uh, migration and refugees. So we have five years. That is the alarm clock that I have swallowed. Uh, I invite everyone in my uh, sphere of influence to swallow an alarm clock and to understand five years is it. That is what we need to do. That doesn't mean that five, year, five years from now we will have solved the problem. It just means that we need an intentional and very, very concentrated effort over the next five years, and then we will still need to continue. But five years need to make the difference. So to the students in the room, uh, you are the first generation that are joining the global economy with full knowledge of climate change. The first generation. Our generation, A, we certainly didn't know where we were going to school. B, we had no idea of what was going on. We inherited this planet. We inherited this, this problem. But our parents certainly didn't know it, our grandparents let alone. Um, we didn't know it. So our responsibility in our generation is to have looked at the science, understood the consequences, and pulled ourselves out of the bootstraps to set a new direction. And I will argue that the Paris Agreement sets an incontrovertible new direction. But, but your generation is the one that is going to have to make that actually happen over the long time, well, the long period. Because what we're going to do is setting a new GPS, okay? We're going to be resetting that GPS for you and saying, we can't go this way, we have to go this way. But as all of you know, no matter what vehicle you use, Setting the GPS doesn't actually get us to where we need to go. We actually have to set the GPS and we have to do the work to get to where we need to go. So what I promise from our generation is we've taken knowledge of the situation. We have over many years with a lot of work and uh, a lot of um, trepidation and a lot of uh, denialism also. But finally, we have actually been able to, uh, to set a new course on paper on paper that is no more than 
resetting the GPS. Now we really need to make that happen. We have spent years creating a new vision, and now we, I argue that we would have to work two, three times as hard to make the new vision as laudable, the new reality, excuse me, as laudable as the vision that we created. That is going to be even harder. That's going to be definitely much, much harder. Um, but my, um, I have two daughters, one of whom is here. And, you know, I have full confidence in, uh, in, in being able to work. I'm not going to put the whole burden on the new generation. I'm saying we, I have full confidence that we can actually work together. I have full confidence that those of us who are still in the last few seconds of our duty on this planet and to make decisions, that we are going to continue to uh, ensure that we are exercising our responsibility in order to then hand over the baton to you with the possibility that you will be able to stand up here, uh, deliver a lecture at Yale, and say, we're out of the danger zone, we're into the world of opportunity. Thanks. Christiana, thank you very much. That was an incredible tour of the transitions required and the uh, imperative, uh, including the time frame that you've given us. So um, I want to push a little further on what it took to get this agreement in Paris, which you've modestly described. Oh, usually, I'm the one that pushes. Are we doing like a change? We are. We're doing a, we're doing a, um, a, a reversal here. Um, but actually, let me pause first and just say thank you for being at Yale. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here laying out this story. And um, as a university, we do try to capture lessons. So I want to try to, um, if not push you, then extract from you some of the learning that I think we all need to take on board. And I would encourage anyone, by the way, who doesn't have a seat, there's some seats up front, some seats still in the middle. So please feel free to jump into one of these open spaces. Um, because we are going to have a conversation here over the next 45 minutes. And you don't borrow toilets. So. <laughs> so you took over right after a very big disappointment from the world community's point of view uh, in terms of what came out of Copenhagen, or should I say what didn't come out of Copenhagen. Um, and you obviously had to do something very different to deliver a different result in Paris, which came about. So what do you think? was the key to success in terms of getting the agreement in Paris last December? Well, I don't think there's one key. Um, I think there were many, many different things. Um, I was going to make a speech about you. I will leave that one here. Um, <laughs> perhaps the, uh, the very fundamental shift is the realization that came over time that the only way to motivate the kind of transformation that is necessary at the global level is to ground it in the, the realization of the benefit at the national level, i.e. not to pit national interest against global need. Because you know what? Uh, and I don't think that should come as a surprise. If you take that down to you know an individual level of the system, if you pit you know one person's individual interest against the community need, you probably will go with your own interest. And that's the same you know at all levels of the system. So that realization came over a certain period of years. Um, and for me, the you know the really fantastic surprise and, and a um, a bet that I happily lost. I'm always happy. Because one of the things that we did, I think, two or three years ago, two or three years ago, was the request for national climate change plans. Um, and the interesting thing was, the question to the countries was, tell us what you can do to contribute to the global effort, but from your national perspective, from 
your, the coherence with your sustainable development planning, from the coherence with your economy, your technology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Look at your reality. See where you want to go as a country over the next 10 to 20 years, and then tell us how does that contribute to the global effort. Well, that's very different than the question that was on the table in Copenhagen. In Copenhagen, it was, this is what the, earth, the, what the uh, world needs, and now here's how we're going to parse it out. And you take this, you take this, or you take that. Well, a very different conversation. So I think that shift uh, was a really a fundamental shift, in addition to the fact, of course, that it was made so much more possible, because in the meantime, the cost of technology had come down. Right? So as I said, you know, 80% uh, reduction in cost. We had much more policy in place uh, with respect to climate change. We had much more science uh, certainty. And unfortunately, we had had many more impacts. So all of that actually came together quite miraculously in Paris. Well, it certainly did. And I think there was um, such a focus on action, which I saw not present in prior conversations. You know, the word of the, uh, of the conference, in my mind, was solutions. Uh, and not only in the official conversation, but in all of the side events. So it does seem like there was a shift into an action mode. Is that something you also tried that, to de produce? Definitely. Um, and, and I would say, you know, that was a, 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 a two-pronged shift. One was also over time between 2008 and 2000, or 2009 and 2015, we realized um, actually quite quickly that this could not be the responsibility and the purview of only national governments. Um, national governments need to set the direction. But you know, they're sort of like the, um, the captain in a boat you know, up there on the bridge, and they set the direction. But they're certainly not the engine room. The engine room is the private sector, the investors, subnational governments. You know, you have to get, if you want to get anywhere, you have to set the direction and you have to put the engine room to work. And so that realization that the engine room was completely absent in, um, in Copenhagen. And so opening up the tent and inviting very, very explicitly, inviting all of these other actors who actually are responsible for making the change happen uh, was very uh, was very important, and to be consistent with my previous argument, they were the first ones. The private sector was actually the first one to understand that answering climate change, addressing climate change, these shifts were in their interest. And a little bit later, the governments understood that it was also a national interest. But the fact that this is in business continuity interest, the fact that there's more opportunities, more growth, more profit to be made overall out of this transformation than what we have now, that was a very important switch in the, in the corporate sector. And, and that motivated them, of course. Um, and then that then well, a little bit later devolved into the nations and the government's understanding that it is also in their interest. Well, I do think the spirit of broader engagement that you were able to produce in Paris, that brought in the private sector, the investors, the mayors, the governors, premiers, did also change the tenor of the conversation yep. in a way that um, helped, I think, drive the action agenda, but it also did um, acknowledge how much work had to be done by so many different parts of the uh, of the world community, and that made a big difference. Yeah, I, you know, I'm I'm really stretched to think of who was not there, and and it doesn't mean you know who was not there in Paris because many people were were not there because it was only thirty thousand people, but um, who was not there Pretty in almost everyone, in the yeah, world. including the whole of Yale, of course, um, but um, which sectors or which interests? did not work toward this. I, you know, I'm very stretched to identify anybody who wasn't. Faith communities, women's groups, youth, um, health, transportation, agriculture, energy, of course. Uh, on and on and on. Banking, investment, insurance companies. Oh my gosh, right? Insurance companies. I mean, on and on and on and on. Each of them from a very distinct, distinct perspective with a very different approach. And many of them actually with different solutions, that some of which contradict each other, but the key there was to open the field broadly enough that all of that could actually be contributing and not exclusionary. Because I think one you know, a big mistake that we made in Copenhagen was there was a feeling of exclusion. 
this is exclusively the right, the obligation, the purview of some. And this was in, in what we built toward Paris was very much on the inclusion and participatory mode. Well, it does suggest, um, and this is the next sort of set of lessons I want to push you to help us with, that the, um, I was thinking you were the conductor of the orchestra, but that suggests too much order. Uh, maybe you were the ringmaster of the circus <laughs> with uh, not just three rings, but six or 10 going on simultaneously. But you did seem to be able to pull it all together. And um, was there a key to the management strategy of that? Because it really, it was quite remarkable that all these parallel conversations that you're describing did converge in Paris, uh, and people sat down and agreed. Yeah, I think it was probably more miracle than science, but. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but um, I think, I think it's helpful to understand what is part of the formal official negotiating process that needs to be guided literally by the text. Every comma counts, every you know, verb counts, et cetera, et cetera. So that needs to be very, very carefully managed and with a lot of detail. Um, and then there is all of the rest of the circus, as you call it, right? Everything else that creates an enabling context and an encouraging atmosphere for the content that will be captured in the text to be as aspirational as possible. So, you know, to understand that the purpose of that intergovernmental negotiation is actually pretty narrow. The purpose of that intergovernmental negotiation is to come to agreement around a legal text. Uh, however, if you only focus on that, you do not have enough of a positive tsunami, if you will, uh, to get that text to the level of aspiration that you need. So you have to cause all of the rest of this, encourage it, fertilize it, which we did over many years, fertilize it, encourage it, con help people to connect the dots with each other so that that really grew, the groundswell really grew around that legal text. But in the end, what we needed was the legal text. Well, you, you did a, a remarkable job of allowing that um, groundswell, as you call it, the uh, out outer rings of the circus, as I'm calling it, to come together in a way that was positively reinforcing. But there must have been a moment when some of the lions were roaring that you thought this isn't going to come together. So what, yeah, was, I mean, the, there, what was the low point? There, the there, are, there are always, you know, at every COP, and, and you know, I guess the climate secretary or this process is most known in the press and in the public for the COPs, which are those two weeks that we have at the end of a year. But, you know, let's remember that this is actually a full-time job. You know, it's ye the whole year through. And we just sort of pop out and come into the press uh, quite a bit um, at the end. Um, but throughout the year or years, as well as during those two weeks, uh, but let's, you know, focus on just on 2015 now, there were many moments, you know, there are many moments when you think, oh my God, you know, this is, the whole thing is going to go down the drain. What was dif different for me in Paris than it was in the previous five COPs is that we already knew a year ahead of time that we were going to get an agreement in Paris. We knew that because we knew that there was such a, a push, right? The, the wall of willingness was so impermeable, so positive, growing every moment um, that we knew that there was no option, that the governments, frankly, had no option but to agree with each other. And frankly, that the governments wanted to agree with each other because they just couldn't conceive of you know, the, the opposite. So we already knew. And we had the luxury of knowing that a whole year ahead of time that we were going to come to the agreement, which allowed us then to really work throughout the last year on not just getting to an agreement that would be a cute photo op, um, but actually to get to an agreement that had teeth in it, that had ambition to it. And that's what we really focused on. For the, for the 12 months before Paris. Well, let me push you on that, because um, one of your prior uh, kind of starting points for this was the Framework Convention of, on Climate Change in 1992. And Maura Strong, uh, who chaired the Earth Summit, at which that convention was put forward, used to like to say that when you gather the world, 100-plus uh, presidents and prime ministers, only two outcomes are possible, success and real success. And what you've just told us is that you were focused on real success over that last year. But let me 
I would say there's a third. Failure is also a third. Copenhagen <laughs> proof is a possibility. But um, it, at least in Copenhagen, they tried to declare success, although it fell apart within days. Um, and I think what you've identified is that people really do feel like there was a, a corner turned in Paris. But what's critical in your mind going forward to make sure this becomes real success? Well, first, let, let me just say, because I don't want us to leave here thinking that Copenhagen was only a failure. I actually have very often talked about Copenhagen as being the most successful failure of the United Nations. Um, and I think the successful part is really important because, A, we got many results out of Copenhagen that actually set the direction for the next few years. Um, plus, I cannot tell you how many lessons learned we derived from Copenhagen, right? We derived an inordinate amount of lessons learned about what not to do and what to improve. So, you know, I, I don't want to put Copenhagen sort of in the demonize Copenhagen because it was actually quite um, quite helpful. But, um, but to your question about how do we ensure that we have real success, it, it has a lot to do with, um, you know, where I ended my my lecture that this, the Paris Agreement, what it sets up is the possibility of a new reality. Uh, but it doesn't guarantee that reality, right? It, it paints it. It's sort of, you know, let, let's think about it as sort of putting the, the big strokes into the, the mural, if you will. Um, but now we have to make that actually the transformation needs to really occur, and it needs to occur in every single sector certainly in the energy sector, in the land use, in transportation, in urban planning, whoa, lot, you know, to be done in urban planning and, you know, on, on down the road. So it, it really is now about how do we take the signal that is put out by the Paris Agreement and translate that into national, subnational policy incentives, regulations, how does the private sector interpret that? How do investments, investors, uh, long-term, particularly long-term investors interpret it? How do we align? Um, and in, in terms of aligning, as, as you would know, the Paris Agreement puts out well below two degrees as a temperature, but it also says the pursuit of 1.5. Um, and I think in our minds, what we need to do is align everything, whatever, institution we're responsible for, whether we're in a bank or whether we're in a, you know, a corporation producing widgets or whatever, we need to align ourselves from a mitigation perspective with the 1.5 because that's the one that is going to cut in and make this really transformational in the short term. And from an adaptation perspective of what we're going to do in order to make ourselves more resilient, we have to align ourselves with the two degrees because that's the maximum, you know, that's, that's the worst case scenario. So we have to be ready for that. So it's the alignment, and then how do we interpret that alignment into every decision that we make? So your answer actually brings us to a couple of the questions that were submitted in advance from uh, the Yale community that was invited to uh, tell me what I should ask you. So um, one of the questions that came in um, was focused on the fact that you're leaving office. You're, you're departing your role with the Secretariat in July. Um, and the question is this, what qualities do you think your successor needs to have to carry forward uh, this process? Um, well, first of all, we don't know who the successor is. That, that process is, um, is underway. But um, what qualities? Yes, what kind of a person should it be? If, if you were I, advising or one, any of these folks were advising the Secretary General, you know, is, is it is it a kind of person like you, or they have different qualities? Have we shifted gears, maybe, is the question. We, d we definitely have shifted gears, right? We definitely have shifted, shifted gears because, uh, you know, the, the, the short answer to that is we have been in a negotiation mode for many years, for 20 years, um, and now we're moving into implementation mode. Um, what that actually means is um, that there is uh, there's much more detailed work to be done now. We don't know we have the big picture, but now there's a lot of nuts and bolts that need to uh, need to occur, um, and a lot of it is going to shift into national level transformation as opposed to the global. But qualities, I think, um, listening skills are very very important because uh, you you do have 196 now countries in the room with at least 395 opinions about everything. Um, and so, you know, A, listening, and that's only the countries. That, you know, doesn't include everybody else, which also needs to be listened to. 
So listening, I think, is very important. Um, understanding that everybody's position and interest is equally valid. Uh, and I think that is really important, was in the past but will be in the future, to not fall into the default of demonizing, okay? So to not demonize those who, you know, have fossil fuels as their natural resources. Well, guess what? They didn't choose that. That's what the country that they were born in. Uh, and, um, or companies, you know, that have been exploiting fossil fuels for years and making a profit out of that. Well, when they began, they didn't know the consequences. Um, and all of those will need our support as they transition into the new economy. So it's, it's both about listening, it's about being non-judgmental, it's about being open, about uh, truly respecting and understanding the incredible diversity of, of, of interests and needs that are on the table and that need to be answered. It's not being dismissive of anyone or any voice. Um, and, you know, continuing to open up the tent. For as much as we open the tent to many, many different people, many different interests and sectors, it's just not enough. So, you know, it has to be someone who has an even larger kimono, if you will, to bring more and more actors into the space. And it sounds like we'll need someone who's more operational. We need to have somebody who really can help facilitate these transitions. Well, I think both. You know, I think the vision also has to be there, right? So it, it does have to be have a strategic vision of where do we need to get over the next five years, but also very much of an operational capacity. So that brings to another, me to another question that was submitted in advance, which um, is along these lines. What do you say to people, including many young people, probably including some in this room, who say, all well and good that you got this agreement, but it's way too little. It's, uh, it's not going to get us where we need to go. Uh, we're, we're facing a, a crisis. You know, I, I think the weakness of the Paris Agreement is that it's too late. I don't think it's too little. Let me speak to that. But I do think that it's too late um, in, in an ideal case, right? Had we been able to reach, but you know, that's counterfactual. It was all clearly not possible for many different reasons. Had we reached this agreement 10 years ago, OK, in 2005, we would still have had a decade and a bit to make the kinds of transformations, certainly in the financial sector um, and in the energy sector, that, um, that are necessary. We have really pushed our luck here quite a bit and pushed ourselves against the wall because the you know, physics, and particularly the physics of the atmosphere, they don't, they're not really interested whether it's COP, you know, 5 or 15 or 21. It's just like, how much junk are you putting up to me? That's all that counts. It doesn't mean it really matter who's putting the junk up there. You know, it's just how much are you going to choke me with? That's the only thing that counts. And we have actually choked my big boss up there, Miss Atmosphere. We've really choked her pretty badly. Um, and so, we are now really hitting hitting a wall, and that is my you know call of the urgency. And the urgency, I think, is the one piece in in uh, Paris that is not very clear, and it's not clear because our assessment was that including this urgency, particularly after the, the, of the next five years, would have actually sunk the agreement, and we would not have been able to get it because those, um, those governments would have felt too immediately threatened. And it was our considered opinion that we better get the big picture, we better get the direction, we better get a powerful signal um, that allows us then later on to derive the urgency from the text, but not to put it blatantly in the text. So that's um, going to lead to another question that was asked. But let me also mention, we'll now, in a just one minute, take questions from all of you. So. Uh, Please think of a question, and we'll make sure our microphones circulate. So here's the question that follows from that. Um, and I think you've stated it as a nice uh, recognition of a trade-off. The more quickly you push the transition, the more money has to be assembled in the short term, the more expensive the transition might be. And um, that does pose some threat or, or could inspire fear in countries that are just getting themselves going, particularly in the global south. So how is it you kept um, the Global South coming with you in what could be perceived as an agreement that uh, challenges their priority on uh, economic development uh, in alleviating poverty and doing the kinds of things that need to be done to 
lift people out of those early stages of development? Well, two, two pieces. Um, first, I'm not convinced that early action is more costly. I actually think that uh, early action ends up being cheaper. Uh, because uh, a couple of things. A, because in that statement, Dan, you're not including the cost of destruction that we will have to pay for, right, with more impacts. Um, and, uh, and you're also um, not including the fact that if we invest uh, into fossil fuel infrastructure, the value of that infrastructure will have to be stranded and that is a huge sunk cost that we will never recuperate. So it, depending on how you, you know, other, other economists argue, well, but if we wait, then, you know, the cost of mitigation technology will come down. Well, yes, but, so it's, it's, it's not a very clear picture of where, where the, the huge cost is. What is clear is what is, where is the peak of human cost? or what is the, the, um, the curve on human cost. And that's very clear. The longer we delay, the more human cost. And so, you know, that cannot be monetized, but should be the primary, um, the primary reason for action. Um, how do you get developing countries to come on board? Well, um, you know, I, I, as you can imagine, because uh, we work with 195 countries, I do spend a lot of time in developing countries. And here's my, you know, fantastic, experience in many of these developing countries where you go to some, I come from a developing country myself, but when you go to the hinterland where there is, you know, no, no, no electricity, uh, no decent roads, da 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 and then you see a fantastic, you know, brilliant, gorgeous, pregnant woman standing there with her cell phone. <laughs> Banking over her cell phone, okay? I mean, that is the kind of transformation that we're talking about. We do not have to follow the linear development that has been followed in the North. And that linear development of the North is basically, you know, more development means more greenhouse gases because we do everything on the back of fossil fuels. Well, fine, that's what we've done in the past, but the past does not have to determine the future. Just like we moved from landlines has anybody here seen a landline lately? No, I'm serious. I mean, how, how, how okay, four people, okay? Four people have seen a landline. I mean, that's the point. We've moved, you know, landlines are basically going the, the route of, uh, of the museum. And everybody has their cell phones in this country, but particularly in developing countries. That's the important thing. Why do cell phones make a lot of sense in developing countries? Because you don't have to buy very expensive copper to build these lines that go out to very decentralized, isolated populations. Well, that's exactly the point. So we can leapfrog, right? We can leapfrog, certainly in the energy sector. There is no need any longer to have centralized energy being produced by fossil fuels that then gets transmitted, distributed, you know, up, you have to put the power up, back, bring it back down, da 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 da, da and then distribute it. it. It just doesn't make any sense because now we have the technology that allows you to have decentralized, localized, multi-directional multi grids that actually get you electricity much closer to home. So I'm not saying that it is a perfect solution or a magical solution, but developing countries are beginning to realize that that is more interesting to them. Today, you have Morocco, uh, you know, a country that is not necessarily known for its technology. I mean, if you know, like, who has cutting edge technology? Okay, well, maybe Germany? No, Morocco. Because Morocco has the largest concentrated solar power plant in the world, 500 megawatts. And that, and, and you can go on down the line, most of the very, very interesting and large scale investments in solar and in renewable energy in general are going into developing countries because they're the ones that need the energy the most. And they're beginning to understand that this is actually in their interest. Right. All right. Questions from all of you? Yes, in the back. Well, we're going to run a microphone, so please tell us who you are and do wait for the microphone. Uh, my name is Sarah Baird. I work um, in distributed renewables in Uganda and Malawi. Um, my question is, 
Uh, decentralized renewables will indeed benefit the extreme poor and stimulate development, but only if there is significant concessionary funding and development aid to prevent the 1.3 billion from becoming debtors to the new energy entrepreneurs. So I'm curious about how the international community is thinking about pro-poor energy access within the new decarbonized economy. See, I don't think that there's a black and white about that um, because um, a, a couple of things. First of all, renewable energy is becoming competitive with fossil fuels very, very quickly, even with, by the way, fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, so even in countries in which renewables don't have subsidies, renewables are very quickly becoming competitive against fossil fuel with subsidies. Um, secondly, we should not assume that there is zero cost for energy on the part of users right now. That is actually incorrect because users are now paying for whatever it is that they're using, right? Kerosene for lighting or, you know, whatever. So there is a, um, a, a flow there of resources that can be redirected, if you will. Um, thirdly, once you do have electricity at home, you become a much more productive citizen and certainly a much more productive family. Um, and so, you know, that, that, that whole family of arguments is, are the family of arguments that buttress the reality that um, it not, doesn't necessarily have to be concessional. It could be market-based. Having said that, may I say there's another part that, of course, concessional or not necessarily concessional, but you know, ev even just reduce cost of capital, uh, where development banks, for example, would be able to buy off some of the risk of those investments and therefore buy down the cost of capital and make those investments much more, much more likely and cheaper is also a very, very powerful way to, uh, to very quickly disseminate this. I do not think that there is, in fact, I know, and it's very few times that I know something, but this I do know. I do know that there is not enough concessional funding in the world to be able to bring electricity to 1.3 billion people. That just doesn't exist. It just doesn't exist. So if we assume that that's the only way that it's going to happen, and we put everything in motion to, on that assumption, we're condemning those people to no electricity. So my way of thinking is, let's figure out how to use some concessional financing that is there to leverage private sector investment, to be smart about how do we get electricity. For me, the point is, let's get them electricity, not how are we going to find finance it. Other questions, uh, including, by the way, we're eager to have questions from our colleagues at UConn. So I hope those of you who are watching on the webcast will uh, shoot in your questions, and we will uh, read them out. Microphone right here. Yes, thank you. My name is Edgar Hertwich. I'm a professor here of industrial ecology. Um, science had really a critical role in the process of climate change to identify the issue, to bring it to the attention, to verify that it is happening, and it's really a driving force behind the agreement that you were talking about. But I wonder from your perspective, will science, will universities have a similar role in the story of mitigation? Uh, or is this more like a groundswell that uh, these entrepreneurs and how, what could you see as the role of universities in the future in helping to actually turn the economy around? Thank you. You know, this is, this is a fantastic example of policy following science. Um, and it was like that from the beginning, right? Even because even just the convention itself was policy's response to science. I'm not going to say that it's been always a very happy marriage, frankly, um, because you know we've had our tumultuous relationship, let's say, between policy and science. But um, but I think Paris was a very good example of policy trying to catch up with science. Science is still two or three steps um, ahead of us, and 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 we're not there with with policy. And I don't think that that relationship is going to change. Uh, we are going to have more and more science. To be very specific, the next step, at least for global climate change science, that is going to be very critical, is the IPCC special report that, fortunately, the IPCC, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has now just uh, accepted that they're going to write which, uh, for 2018, which are the implications of 1.5 degrees as a limiting temperature. 
that is going to be incredibly informational for the negotiation of the governments that will take place at the end of 2018. And that's why it was requested um, in order to inform the negotiations. So at a global climate change science, I cannot imagine any condition under which policy and negotiations won't continue to follow science in particular because we're beginning to get data that we've actually underestimated the impact of greenhouse gas emissions and we're going to have to play catch up um, continually. A. B. The role of universities. Well, can you imagine the desperate need that we have now, uh, for example, from engineering to create much, much better technology on everything that has to do with smart grids, you know, self-driving cars, everything to do with renewable energy, da 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 all of that that is, you know, fundamentally to, um, to engineering. Can you imagine anybody who has more responsibility on how are we going to uh, restore, uh, for everybody having to do with soil uh, science, forestry science, how are we going to restore all of this degraded land? What is the best way to do it? How do we bring down costs? How, how do we... Um, regrade, if you will, from degrade to regrade, all of the land that has to, um, that has to occur. Um, so whether, you know, you're looking at it from the energy perspective, whether you're looking at it from the land perspective, or those who are in urban planning, we absolutely need new designs for cities. This thing that we have built cities for roads, buildings, and bridges is completely stupid. We should be building cities for people. For people, we should be building organic, we should not be building cities. We should be growing organic cities, right? We should not have or, uh, urban sprawl. We should have urban gardens that we all live in. It's completely new recasting of what urban planning is all about. So, you know, it doesn't matter what you're looking at. It is very, very clear that we need universities, science, all of the brain power, brain power. Right here. Thank you, Christina, um, also for your leadership. And I think a lot of us um, are very much inspired by you as a role model. So thank you very much for that. Um, and I think I want to talk about these five years that we have ahead. A lot of us will be graduating soon. So we have five years to put our, yeah, yeah, we will, <laughs> I hope. Um, we have five years to put our energy somewhere very, hopefully very effectively. So can you give us some advice in where you would advise us to go? Where should we be working? Where should we put our energy to help and be most effective in a transition? And building on that, how we can, can we best work with your generation and between a generation in power now, like we talked about earlier, and generation coming into the field but not yet in power? How can we establish these intergenerational partnerships that are actually effective? So, I'm, you know, I think the wonderful thing about this is that there are so many possibilities. And if, if I were in your shoes, if I were, you know, restarting my professional life, the first question that I would ask myself is, where, at what level of the system do I want to direct my passion? Do I want to, first of all, am I going to work with passion? Because suggestion number one, never work without passion because it's just not worth it, okay? Um, suggestion number two is where do I want to direct that passion? Do I, is, am I passionate about change at the global level? Some people are, some people are not, okay? I happen to be passionate there, but many people say, you know what, it is so far removed from reality, it just doesn't say anything to me. That's a valid argument. So you have to figure out, are you passionate about global change, which is powerful, it's sort of systemic change, but it's very difficult to see the, the change on the ground, or are you more interested at the national level, or subnational, or communal, or family level? You have to, first of all, I think, figure out where you feel more comfortable in the level of the system. Um, that would be a, f a first sort of orientation. And then secondly, of course, there is honestly no sector uh, of human endeavor that is not touched by climate change. And I think, you know, one thing that is a little bit difficult to sort of wrap our heads around is we tend to think about, okay, I'm going to contribute to climate change solutions because I'm going to work in the energy sector or I'm going to work in, you know, whatever, land use sector. The fact is, you choose the profession that you want, you choose the sector that you want, you're already, by definition, affected by climate change. Nothing that we do is unaffected. What we need to do, or what your generation needs to do, is put on climate change glasses and look at whatever it is that you want to do through those glasses and understand you're breathing a different air 
to the air that was breathed 200 years ago. It is dramatically different. So you need to approach every single thing that you do. It doesn't matter what you choose. You just need to approach it from the perspective of, A, we have to get ready for many more impacts. We have to increase our resilience. And we have to do everything possible to bring down our emissions. And those two need to be there no matter what you do. There is no such thing as, I'm going to you know, work on climate change by doing this. You can work on climate change in the, independently of what sector you, you work on. It's more, more than a sector to choose. It's an attitude. It's a behavioral. It's an awareness and, um, and should influence the decisions that you take on a daily basis. We've got a question coming in from UConn. Please read it out. So this question is from Anji Seth at UConn and Stores. Please share your thoughts on the role of carbon pricing in the next steps and how it might be implemented and harmonized across nations. Well, you know, honestly, if we had a carbon price around the world that everybody could agree with, it would make life so much easier um, because it would, you know, help for finance flows to be directed in the right direction. It would help for technologies to be di uh, um, developed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It would, it would make life much easier. But, you know, that's pie in the sky. That's ideal world. It is not the reality that we have. Um, and the reality that we have is that we have sort of a mushrooming exercise around carbon pricing where we currently have 60 jurisdictions around the world that have some kind of a carbon price. Two-thirds of them um, derive the carbon price from an emissions trading system and one-third of them from a carbon tax. Um, and the prices are actually very dissimilar to each other because they go all the way from $6, which India, yay, India just set a carbon tax of uh, $6 a ton uh, at the beginning of this month. So it goes all the way from 6 to about 35 or 40 more or less. That's sort of the range that we have on carbon price per, um, per jurisdiction. And I don't think that it's going to be possible to get a carbon price, uh, a universal or agreed to at the level. I don't think there's going to be universal price discovery over the next few years. I think we will still see these isolated attempts and, and experiments perhaps to come to carbon price and then the very, very painstaking, very, very difficult linking of, you know, carbon scheme A with B or with C, da, da, da. very, very difficult. Um, ideally, of course, we would be able to link all of them and there would be a, a, a universal price that would make things much more, uh, much easier, but that's not what we have. I think, you know, in the, in the near term, what is really going to affect carbon price, both in terms of um, equivalency of price across uh, across jurisdictions, but also the speed uh, with uh, the speed and the scope with which carbon price can advance, is actually China, uh, and China is going to go to a single carbon price with a single carbon market next year, as early as next year, um, uh, because currently they have uh, six different pilots that are currently ongoing, as soon as they go to a national market and a national price, I think that that will actually have huge ripple effects on the price of carbon around the world. Because if China has a price of, on carbon, and depending on how they choose to, um, to, uh, to use that with respect to their exports and maybe even their imports, um, that I think is going to have a huge ripple effect. Great. Thank you. Question here. Hi, I'm John. I'm a doctoral student here in engineering and one of Dan's students. Um, when we look at the INDCs that have been submitted, uh, many countries are asking for better uh, help in building capacity, and also many are rolling out measurement and reporting systems to be transparent with their carbon emissions going forward. I'm curious as to what role, if any, you see the UNFCCC playing in facilitating this process and enabling people to have um, state of the practice tools for collecting and, and reporting data on emissions? Um, I, I do think, uh, well, I, I don't think I know. There's another second thing that I know. That's pretty amazing in one day. Um, <laughs> the UNFCCC secretariat has been given a, a mandate um, to be the repository of, uh, of this information. Um, just like we are currently the repository of the inventories that, uh, that countries report. Um, and so, as you probably know, because just 
deriving from your question, there is a much more enhanced monitoring, reviewing, and verification process that has been agreed to that builds on the current MRV process but is much more detailed and more frequent and the scope is enlarged because it was a, a smaller subset of countries that were um, under that uh, uh, requisite um, reporting before and now it's everyone. So, but, but the developing countries, most of them, do not have yet the technical skills to do that. So there, ha there does have to be a process of capacity building and supporting them to be able to do the monitoring and the reporting that they need to do, and then the verification that needs to occur for on the part of uh, third parties. So yes, we will be in the center of that, and we are currently um, in the process of beefing up our own um, uh, team capacity to be able to do this, which we won't do centralized out of Bonn, but we will do it in, in consonance with, um, with different experts uh, around the world. Um, and there is also, all of this costs money, and I'm happy that um, there is actually already a project underway that is called the MRV Trust Fund, which actually is putting charitable money from foundations that are going in to help developing countries develop this um, this capacity in order to accelerate their reporting into the climate secretariat. So it's it's a very very important part of the Paris Agreement because you know in in a situation in which the Paris Agreement the numbers if I will you know if you will the numbers that are encapsulated in the IEC are not legally binding right they are there they are more illustrative than anything else. Um, they're not legally binding, but but the MRV process, you know, the 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 accountability and the the truth telling, if you will, of uh, of progress is legally binding, and that really is the backbone of the Paris Agreement. That is what gives it the environmental integrity. That's the teeth. It's not the numbers, because the numbers that's a very different conception to the Kyoto Protocol. And so the fact that that is the, the, the backbone and the integrity of it means that we really have to focus there. That is the piece that is going to tell us every five years, are we walking down the path we want to and should, or are we crawling back like the crabs? So we have time for one last question and a quick question and a quick answer right here. Hi, um, I'm really curious to know where do you personally see yourself going from here? Onwards, like next Perfect five last years. Question. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> well, eventually to the train station and back to New York <laughs> at three o'clock. Um, you know, um, I will finish in, in July on the sixth of July um, to be to be very specific, and um, I'm not exactly sure how yet, but I'm going to be devoting myself to this five-year urgency uh, because I just don't think it's fair. Uh, that our generation has sort of taken this almost to where it should be, but not quite. Uh, and so I'm going to be working on the not quite. And I'm going to be, uh, you know, fair warning to the world. Um, I've never been known for being exceedingly diplomatic, but, um, <laughs> but I'm going to be even less diplomatic after July. Uh, and I'm going to be really very, very bold and very brazen because the situation requires it. This is not, you know, pussyfooting anymore. This really is uh, very, very serious. And I don't think there's enough awareness about the seriousness of what we have here. So I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to do that. But I know it's not going to be timid. Uh, and, um, yeah. Um. <laughs> I cannot think of a better place to end. Um, and I hope you will all join me in thanking Christiana, not only for her wonderful appearance here at Yale today, her thoughtful comments, her careful and uh, inspiring answers to questions, but thank you on behalf of all generations here and into the future for what you have done.